Hi, I'm Jason Cryan, the Executive Director of the Natural History Museum of Utah, and welcome to Stories from Egypt, a series of four lectures inspired by Egypt, the time of pharaohs. This remarkable special exhibition tells the story of one of the world's most advanced civilizations. Starting more than 5,000 years ago, the pharaohs built magnificent pyramids and temples. They produced extraordinary art, and you may be surprised to hear they wrote love songs. These love songs are inspired by the environment in which the ancient Egyptians lived, and particularly the Nile River, the source of life for so many then and now. And they reveal emotions that are familiar to us all everywhere today. To give you a sense of these powerful stories and some of the mystery that surrounds them, we've invited Egyptologist Cynthia May Sheikh Salami to join us here in the exhibition. Cynthia studied ancient Egypt at the Institute of Fine Arts at New York University, the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago, and at UCLA. She first traveled to Egypt in the early 1970s on a Fulbright Fellowship, and then lived there for most of the past 35 years. Cynthia became interested in ancient Egyptian love songs earlier in her career. As a graduate student at the University of Chicago, she met a classmate, the late John L. Forster. Forster was a professor of English who was fascinated with Egyptian love songs. He studied and translated them, and he ultimately published a book called The Love Songs of the New Kingdom. Cynthia will read from and reference that book in her talk. Cynthia thinks about Egyptology as a perpetual detective story, a series of mysteries just waiting to be solved. And luckily for us, she's a talented investigator. Here's Cynthia with her own story of discovery. It begins at a time of great transition and upheaval for modern Egypt. At the time of the Egyptian Revolution in 2011, I was confined to my apartment, which is located about six blocks from Tahrir Square, the center of the action that was shown worldwide on TV. I was working on a paper about pomegranates as funerary offerings. Suddenly I remembered that one of my favorite love songs is supposedly recited by a pomegranate bush. I turned to my bookshelf and pulled off John Foster's book and turned to his translation of this song. It begins, the pomegranate bush raises its voice, tiny, insistent, shrill. Its seeds shine like the teeth of my mistress. The shape of my fruit is round like her breasts. Suddenly, these words seemed very strange to me. Who would want their beloved to have shiny red teeth like a zombie matching the seeds of the pomegranate? Or hold this fruit with its leathery, tough, lumpy, round shape in their hand and imagine it was a woman's breast. An Egyptologist is trained always to look at the original sources instead of relying on translations. So I turned to my bookshelf and pulled out another book on ancient Egyptian love poetry. And I turned to the plate with the transcription of this papyrus, which is in the Egyptian Museum in Turin. As I looked at the transcription into hieroglyphs, I realized that the beginning of the papyrus was broken away. This transcription of the love song is in hieroglyphs, but the original papyrus in the Egyptian Museum in Turin is written in the cursive form of hieroglyphs called hieratic. So I looked at a photograph of the papyrus in Turin as well. Since it's clear that the beginning of this love song is broken away on the papyrus, I wondered where the idea that a pomegranate bush was speaking came from. After some more searching, I discovered one of the earlier translations of this love song written by a German Egyptologist in 1932. This male scholar apparently had in mind the only round fruit he knew about from the ancient Near East, the pomegranate. He therefore inserted this restoration into his translation and has been followed by people ever since. Because I've lived in Egypt, I know that if you hold a pomegranate in your hand, it's a tough, leathery skin, and it feels quite lumpy, not at all like a female breast. Perhaps also the German scholar was thinking of the rosy cheeks of the beloved 
that are compared to a pomegranate in the biblical Song of Songs, which is known to incorporate themes from ancient Egyptian literature. Pomegranates were introduced into Egypt from their native habitat in Iran at the beginning of the New Kingdom, about 1400 BC. There's a silver pomegranate vase from the tomb of Tutankhamun, and pomegranates appeared as ornaments in jewelry, such as one of the necklaces in this exhibit. They were used as food offerings to the god Osiris and funerary offerings to the deceased person in his tomb. They are listed as among the trees that grow in orchards belonging to temples. However, they do not appear in ancient Egyptian literature. I read further in the papyrus and found that there were verses where the tree describes itself. And I set to work preparing a new translation of it. The tree says, I remain through every season. All go away. In other words, apparently stop fruiting, except me in the garden. I make or spend 12 months in the orchard. I begin to develop or sprout a bug, a bud, in other words, a new fig, when that of last year is still within me. I know that ancient Egyptians were very careful observers of nature. This is clear from their paintings and tomb reliefs. Since I was shut up in my apartment in Cairo during the revolution upset, I gave myself an online course in botany. I looked up all the information I could find about all the trees that are known to have grown in ancient Egypt. There is only one fruiting tree that grew in ancient Egyptian orchards that has the characteristics described in the poem. This is the sycamore fig tree. I know this tree doesn't grow in the U.S., so I brought along some pictures that I took in Egypt to show you what it looks like. The figs develop from buds on separate branchlets attached to the trunk. And since the tree produces five crops while fruiting year round, the mature figs and even the old dried up ones are still on the branchlets when the new green figs start to develop. This is just what the love song describes. The soft maturing fig is shaped like a young woman's tender breast. When a sycamore fig is cut in half, the ovaries inside the fruit sack resemble little white teeth in an open mouth, the very image evoked in the opening lines of the love song. That is quite a story. Thank you, Cynthia. Next, we've invited Cynthia to read translations of three love songs. Here she is reading from John Forster's book, The Love Songs of the New Kingdom. Before we end our visit to ancient Egypt, I'd like to share with you some of John Forster's translations of ancient Egyptian love songs. I hope they evoke the land of the Nile for you and help bring you closer to the emotions that we can share with ancient Egyptians. The first song, Love, how I'd love to slip down to the pond, bathe with you close by on the bank. Just for you, I'd wear my new Memphis swimsuit made of sheer linen, fit for a queen. Come, see how it looks in the water. Couldn't I coax you to wade in with me? Let the cool creep slowly around us. Then I dive deep down and come up for you dripping. Let you fill your eyes with the little red fish that I'd catch. And I'd say, standing there tall in the shallows, look at my fish, my love, how it lies in my hand, how my fingers caress it, slip down its sides. But then I'd say softer, eyes bright with your seeing, a gift, love, no words. Come closer and look, it's all me. The environment in which they lived contributed greatly to the imagery of ancient Egyptian love songs. Listen to another of Foster's translations. Voice of the wild goose crying, 
calling me, caught by my lure. But your loving me slows my going. Tangled, I cannot work free. Love, let me go. Nets of my own need untying. What am I going to tell mother? Each day's end, returning to her. Bent double under my catch. Hi! No tripping the snare lines today. Wild goose, I hear your call. I'm captive, taken by love of you. The last love song I'd like to read for you in Foster's translation is this one. The voice of the swallow, flittering, calls to me. Lands a light, wither away. No, little bird, you cannot entice me. I follow you to the fields no more. Like you, in the dawn mist I rose. At sunrise discovered my lover abed. His voice is sweeter. Wake, I said, or I fly with a swallow. And my heart smiled back when he, smiling, said, You shall not fly, nor shall I, bright bird. But hand in hand, we shall walk the Nile side pathways under the cool of branches, hidden, only the swallows watching. Wide-eyed girl, I shall be with you in all glad places. Can you match the notes of that song, little swallow? I am first in his field of girls. My heart, dear sister, sings in his hand. Love never harmed a winged creature. I'm very glad to have spent this time in the land of the Nile with you. I'm glad that you could join me, and I hope you enjoy getting to know the people of ancient Egypt, brought to you by the flood of the Nile and ending with the love of your hearts. Thanks so much for joining us for this look at love songs from ancient Egypt. I hope you've enjoyed Cynthia's talk and I encourage you to check out the other three lectures in our Stories from Egypt series. And finally, a very special thank you to Cynthia May Sheikh Salami. Cynthia has been an amazing resource during the museum's presentation of Egypt, the time of pharaohs. And we're so grateful for her time, her expertise, and her commitment to sharing the wonders of ancient Egypt with all of us.